Thank you so much for joining us. Today we're talking about how to transition your restaurant to online ordering. My name's Amber Van Mosner. I'm the Senior Director of Communications at Upserve. Uh, and we're really thrilled to be bringing this topic to you because I know a lot of our customers have reached out asking about online ordering. Things are really crazy right now. So we wanna make sure you have as many resources as possible at your disposal. Uh, before we get started, I just wanna do a quick poll. I'd love to know what restaurant you have. Do you have a quick service restaurant, a little more fast food, fast casual counter service, fine dining, upscale casual, a bar? What are we looking at here? Give folks a little more time to answer. Looks like upscale casual is in the lead right now. Oh, we got a bar and grill. I think that qualifies as a bar. Or you could say you're uh, upscale casual, depending on your bar. All right, upscale casual is the winner, but it looks like we got a really good mix of folks here today. So that is helpful for us to know in terms of uh, what we're dealing with. All right, so we're gonna get started with our slides here. Today we're covering a few topics. Uh, we wanna talk about how to transition your restaurant to takeout and online ordering if you aren't doing so already, um, how to think about staffing for takeout and delivery, and how to prepare to reopen after this whole crisis is passed. Uh, we're also gonna look at some data from over 10,000 upserved customers using online ordering to stay in business. Uh, and this restaurant is brought to you by Upserve. We're a restaurant management platform and POS that makes your restaurant wildly successful. Uh, and we're also doing this webinar in partnership with Seven Shifts. Um, they help power up your restaurant with the communication, scheduling, and labor, ma labor management tools you need to be successful. Uh, we have a really exciting expert panel today. Um, here with us is Donald Burns, the restaurant coach. He works with thousands of restaurants around the country to help them run better restaurants and understand their business. So he's gonna to talk to us a little bit about recovery and what reopening looks like down the road. We also have Nate Riley, who's the co-owner of Three Magnets Brewing in Olympia, Washington. Uh, Nate's doing some really neat stuff in terms of community engagement um, with his online ordering and takeout and is thinking about pivoting his business in a really interesting way. So he'll talk about that in a little bit. We also have Kate Dixon from Bywater. Bywater is in Warren, Rhode Island, our neighbor in Providence. Um, she's doing some really innovative stuff with online ordering and has really quickly pivoted her business. So we're excited to hear from her as well. I wanna mention that we will be taking questions at the end just to keep the flow going. Um, so please put your questions uh, in the Q&A um, or in the chat. We will get to as many as we possibly can. So stick with us through the end and we will answer your questions. If you have a question specifically for Upserve, for Seven Shifts, or for one of our panelists, uh, please note that and we will direct it to them. All right, let's get started. So just a quick overview of what we're seeing on our end in the industry. Uh, not so breaking news, online ordering sales are way up. Uh, folks still wanna go out to eat, folks still want to not cook, um, so they are getting access to the, that food and that hospitality any way they can uh, through takeout and delivery. And you can see this is based on our uh, 10,000 customers in the U.S., um, our data from them. Uh, takeout is way, way up. Delivery is a little bit behind, um, but the numbers uh, are clearly going up and to the right. So this is something that if you're not doing at your restaurant, you need to get in on this. And here we have uh, our trends by geographic area. So if you're thinking, you know, my restaurant's in a rural area or my restaurant's in a community where folks don't really do takeout and delivery, um, this, we're seeing this trend across demographics. So there's really no excuse to think about how to make this work for your restaurant. And that's exactly what we're gonna walk you through today. So first up on our customer panel is Kate Dixon. Uh, as I mentioned before, she's a co-owner of Box of Family Restaurant in Warren, Rhode Island, upscale casual, community focused. Um, they initially shut down when uh, the dining ban was put in place in Rhode Island. Um, but then with Upserve Online Ordering, they were able to pivot and reopen for takeout. So Kate, I will let you take it away. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> there we go. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, so we did shut down. Um, 
I know you wanted to kind of have me talk about like that first, you know, critical week and a half where no one in the country uh, from a restaurant standpoint knew what the heck was going on. Um, and really what I ended up doing was sort of just being a sponge and my poor kids just saw mom on the phone, like on social media for like a week and a half, just like absorbing what everyone around me in the community was saying. Um, so we were open for dine-in service um, until about 24 hours before the governor of Rhode Island shut us down. So we, you know, tried our best to be, you know, safe and, and put out all the news that we were, you know, practicing social distancing, taking tables out of the restaurant, everything that everyone else was doing. And then we kind of hit a wall with that. And we, we were looking at all the data and, um, you know, right when other peers and other, you know, other moms, other <laughs> um, people in my area were starting to, you know, use the hashtag stay home, start to be really, really um, vocal about the fact that we needed to shut everything down is when we decided, okay, you know, our customer base wants to be safe and wants to end us like we need to be leaders on this because we weren't getting any leadership from the state or from federal um so we did shut down and then about three days later we reopened um i think we only had to do phone ordering for takeout for one day i think we had like 24 hours of onboarding with upserve and then we were all online for that um so it felt dramatic but it was i think it was really key to be a little bit ahead of where public opinion was and i think you know, I think that's the advice I would give to anyone is to, you know, just be a sponge and like look at what obviously what the experts are saying, but also like what does your community want? Do they want to they want to trust you more than anything? Um, so being a little bit ahead of that was key. Um, and I think it also made it a little more seamless for takeout because they saw that we were just like engaged every day, putting information out, putting our own thoughts and feelings and, and whatever out there. Can you tell me a little bit about how you switched up your menu for online ordering? Because obviously you couldn't do your full full scale menu yeah. uh, when you made this change. I mean, we are the kind of restaurant that was like not set up for online ordering at all. I mean, we had like the kind of menu that would, would sell out of certain things every single day. The menu would, I would be reprinting physical copies of the menu every night. Um, it was like a relatively tiny menu, but then when you put it online, it looks huge. You're like, that's too many options, but we had all this product. So it did take us like a good, I think a good week to just like go through some product you know, whittle down the entrees to like three or four kind of things. Um, and then even now that we kind of know where we want to be in terms of, you know, we want to have this many snack items, this many like larger shareable items, even though we kind of intellectually know that it still doesn't always work with like the product we have in house. So, you know, we'll, <laughs> there was definitely a, like a couple weeks there where we like open up for takeout and have like a pasta and that's it. So like we had a couple like missed steps um, when we first opened just because the supply chain was all crazy. Um, we couldn't get stuff in from farmers that we would been used to getting in. So, um, yeah, it was a learning, a learning curve. But um, I think now that we've been doing it for a while, like my ideal is to kind of plan out my week three or four days ahead so that I can start to market what it is we're going to be offering, whether it's fish and chips on Friday or burger night um, and kind of get the buzz out. And then you have to be prepared for success more than anything because, you know, people are stuck in their houses. They love good content coming at them, social media, newsletters all that stuff. Um, and so we made the mistake of launching a fish and chips night, like right before Lent. Um, and I think we had like 30 orders. <laughs> so we sold out in like a half an hour and that was vastly annoying. Um, and we figured it out for the week after, but, um, I mean, I think going into this, you know, hindsight being 2020, it would have been like, no, like your customer still loves you and still wants to support you. So hedge your bets a little bit and prepare for it to be popular. Can you tell me a little bit about how you're using the insights in your upserve platform to sort of make decisions about how to put things on the menu that will be high popularity but also high margin? Yeah, I mean, I mean the the upserve, um, like what what do you guys call it? The magic quadrant, I think. It's like this <laughs> like this grid of things that like we might think are popular, but upserve will tell us like really only they get them one time and then they don't get them any ever ever again. Um, and then there's a section of the of the graph where it graphs um, what are the things over the last year and a half that you've had on your menu that people keep coming back for. And so we've been trying to, you know, not curtail our creativity, but just be more mindful that like people want comfort food, people want to feel uh, taken care of during this time. So we look at that part of the graph and think, okay, so they came in four, five times for this one dish over the course of like three months. We're going to put that on our to go menu. Like they're going to love that. Um, and then we try to stay away from the things that are like, you know, we're really excited about putting bouillabaisse 
on the menu, that might not be the best like to go thing. I don't know. Um, so we're gonna have to wait and see and then observe and like down the product mix and just see, okay, like that was a cool risk to take and people really like having like a more elegant dining option on the weekends, but we don't need to offer it during the week or have to down. Cool. And I'd love if you could share. Yeah, absolutely. And I'd love if you could share. I know you're working with a lot of different providers. Um, again, talking about supply chain issues. I know that Bywater yeah. did a lot of partnerships and pop ups um, when you were open for business traditionally. So tell me a little bit about how that's working out with your to go menu. Yeah, so I think um, so we had been actually over the summer. I'm mean, sorry, the winter. Winter is mellow for us. We're like by the water, obviously. Um, and so we've been doing a lot of collaborations, a lot of visiting chefs and pop ups and things. So it did kind of feel like all the air had left the room at first when we were forced to do to go because it was like all the fun collaborative stuff we've been doing was sort of like done. Um, and it took us a little while to like kind of regain the like, oh, no, like you can still collaborate. You just have to do it in a, in a way that doesn't involve like a visiting chef or having more people in the building. Um, and it ended up kind of working out perfectly because you know, we've had to shift away from a lot of smaller farm purveyors because they ended up doing a lot of direct to retail stuff, which is great, like direct to consumer. So like people are getting their groceries now from the same platform that we used to use to get our wholesale um, for the restaurant, which means that we're locked out and like we can't get our like farm fresh eggs and our, you know, our greens from the guy down the street. So we're using more centralized, um, you know, it's still local, um, but we're using more centralized distributors for that kind of thing, like Sid Wainer, people like that. Um, but on the flip side in Rhode Island, fishermen can't really sell direct to consumer yet, although I think it's in the works. So the local fishing industry really needed support. And we were like, oh, this is a perfect time to diversify our vendors there. Um, and so it just so happened that we um, finally reached out to some people we'd wanted to work with for a long time called Andrade's Catch out in Bristol, Rhode Island, uh, ordered a cod from them for our first couple uh, <laughs> um, fish and chips nights, which we sold out completely. The New York Times covered their efforts to keep fishermen in business. It ended up being this like perfect uh, marriage in terms of marketing, products, everything, the vibes were very good. Um, and, but, you know, we're dealing now with vendors that we had wanted to deal with for a while and just never had the opportunity to. Um, and then at the, on the flip side, we're dealing a little more with like, unfortunately, Amazon, um, but trying to get, you know, takeout containers, trying to get things that we need to operate to go has been a little bit like playing whack-a-mole. It's like, all right, someone has toilet paper. All right, someone has bags. Okay, someone has this, but no, they don't have the big bags we need. So it's like, okay. That requires a little more like clicking around and trying to figure that out. But. And I'd love if you could talk to me about how you're sort of strategically staffing your takeout operation. You're a small um, you know, organization to begin with, but I loved how you were kind of trying to think about that with the community in mind. Can you share a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, so we're super lucky in that we're small. So I think any business that is used to doing, you know, 30, seats, 40 seats a night or, uh, at one time, uh, but like under 100 covers on a busy night, you know, you're kind of already perfectly primed for like a very sustainable to-go model anyway, because it's sort of what you can handle um, out of a kitchen that needs to be distanced at six feet. Um, so we were able to kind of look at each of our employees' situations uh, and do layoffs strategically. I know not every business can do that, but um, we were able to be like, okay, these folks are coming from out of town or they have to take public transportation, which puts them at risk. Uh, we were able to lay those people off so they can get their benefits. Uh, and then, <laughs> again, this is very specific to my restaurant. We happen to be in a very walkable community. Um, and so we have a lot of staff that live right here. I can just walk to work. So community spread was less of an issue because these were people that our guests were seeing anyway, like out on the street. Um, and they weren't having to drive here or they weren't living with, you know, a bunch of students <laughs> at the local culinary school or anything like that. Um, so we kept on. I would say like a third of our staff um, and they all were very, very local. And that's changing a little bit. The last couple of days I've put the call out to some of our staff um, that feel comfortable to come in, obviously with masks and gloves and whatnot to you know, pick up a few shifts here and there. But for the most part, we've been operating with just local staff. Um, and because of the, I don't know if this is the same for every state, but in Rhode Island, it's definitely five people or less for gatherings. So we've been sort of taking that to heart. So we never staff more than four people, um, which makes me busy. Um, so we have two front of house and two back of the house and they just tag team the whole night. Um, and we're only open for pickup for four hours. So it's not, it's not that crazy, but um, they can definitely get running uh, when it gets busy. 
Well, I hope you're okay with me sharing this, but uh, one of the reasons we reached out to you initially, despite uh, having a long relationship with your restaurant, is that your sales <laughs> are now back up to pre-COVID levels, um, which yeah. is really incredible, and it's an amazing success story. So I'd love if you could share you know, why you think you've been able to land there um, when other restaurants are still kind of struggling. Yeah, um, well, like I said before, I think, I think absorbing what the community wanted from their peers and wanted from their services uh, at first was really key, you know, building, building trust. Um, I think, you know, some of them, you know, not to dwell on missteps, but I think making sure that customers know that their safety is your priority, but also not beating that to death. Like everyone knows that everyone knows that we want to be safe. Everyone's wearing masks, gloves, you know, you kind of don't have to go into that anymore. It's been a month. We all, we're all kind of on that playing field. Um, but to keep the communication up with them in terms of, you know, your personal uh, thoughts and feelings on uh, what's happening in the community. And then also just like responding to their feedback, you know, right away, um, which is hard because like now we're all working from home and I had to lay off um, my social media guru who had been canceling all the communication, but I think being really available um, to everyone has been key. And I'm in a weird um, position. So we're not in Providence. So we don't have that like critical mass of uh, city folk who are looking for takeout. Um, so we're in the suburbs. And so we have kind of a wider area of people who are willing to drive for takeout, which is interesting. We have people coming from the South Coast in Massachusetts, which is like 20, 30 minutes away, making like a weekly trip. Um, and so we're really trying to do a deep dive into that demographic and just make sure that those are the people we're keeping super happy. So they're coming back, you know, every week, twice a week. Um, and yeah, and just making sure we're communicating with them. And I think, um, I think the other thing too that is helpful is just um, you know being really nimble with pricing, being really nimble with reacting to you know the weather, <laughs> you know little things. So it's like restaurants and, and restaurant people are this way anyway. So I think this is a especially traumatic and dramatic time, but it's really just taking what you do anyway and just you know kind of micro focusing it, um, which is not a term, but. Um, so that you're really reacting like hour by hour, um, you know, if it's a beautiful day and we had something planned that was like a mac and cheese and it turns out it's going to be 60 degrees and sunny and no one wants that. It's like, okay, you've got to pivot, got to figure out something else to promote that day. Um, so, you know, in a way it's like, yeah, we're doing almost the same kind of revenue we were doing uh, in winter. And it's really cool to see what that will mean for the future in terms of labor costs and all of that. And how can we, you know, how can we turn what we're, what we're learning now into, you know, even better success for dine-in when it comes to staffing and all that and how we pay our employees. Um, so it's all really exciting, but at the same time, it is, you know, a huge amount of uh, energy on, on my part and on the part of, you know, my staff that's helping out, helping out with all that stuff um, for, you know, almost, almost the revenue we were used to, but not quite. Um, so I don't know, does that answer your question? I feel like there's more, but. Yeah, no, I think that's super helpful. And uh, I want to remind folks, if you have questions for, for Kate, just pop them in the Q&A. We'll get to them at the end. Um, I love if you could just also share, you're running your Olo operation through Upserve Online Ordering versus you know, third-party apps. Um, can you talk mm -hmm. about why? Um, well, to be honest, it was so convenient. So like we had Upserve, loved Upserve, and I didn't really know anything about the online ordering. Um, I just, I knew it existed because I remember seeing like my inbox being bombarded with like, oh, hey, we do this thing now. Um, so when we had to add something to the website, I was like, what is going to be the, the fastest thing? Um, and I did not expect it to be as fast as Upserve actually was. I think you guys got us literally online in like 24 hours, which was crazy. Um, so the fact that you were willing to kind of like go to bat for us and give us you know, a few months, I don't, I don't remember what exactly the deal is, but I think, I think we have a few months of a uh, free online ordering to start out. Um, but, and just having it like automatically print to our kitchen so that we don't have to have like a hostess, like always there, like monitoring this whole separate iPad situation, which I feel like would be a nightmare. Um, so yeah, it was, it was mostly just how convenient it was and the fact that it, you know, we can then look at our data and it's complete. I'm not trying to like download something from another like third party thing. Great. Well, um, really quickly, I'd love to hear just what you're thinking about for the future. I know you've got some like Mother's Day boxes that we are going to feature later in the presentation, but um, just really quickly, how are you kind of looking ahead and planning ahead? 
Yeah, well, I mean, um, I was really inspired actually by, uh, I think you had a conversation with me um, a couple of days ago, and we were talking about best practices of other, other businesses. And there's a few in my area that are offering kind of grocery site type um, because it is so hard for people who are working from home and are stuck at home with kids to get things like eggs and fresh, you know, um, vegetables and stuff like that. Um, but we're not really um, set up to do that in a sense that like we have no walk-in. <laughs> we're like so ultra tiny. We have like two stand-up refrigerators. So I couldn't do that and it really frustrated me because I thought that would be a cool service. Um, and so the more I thought about it, the more I was like, you know what the biggest thing that is like, uh, stopping people from being able to support the small businesses that they want to support is really the logistics because people have specific pickup times or it's like maybe you want to like get flowers from down the street but you're just not going to be there that day that they're open um so i decided to like, kind of go out on a limb and do like a csa style um curated box of you know treats from us wine and beer uh pantry staples that kind of thing as well as goodies from like other small businesses in the area that i wanted to support um and my hope was that I would then have enough purchasing power to like make a difference in their day <laughs> or in their week so that they could plan a little bit. You know, it, most people don't have loans yet from the government. They don't have their unemployment yet if they are applying for unemployment. So these little businesses just don't have any real cash flow. And um, we were able, and you know, this is small potatoes compared to a lot of places, but in my little town of Warren, uh, it was kind of a big deal. We sold like $10,000 worth of boxes uh, in like 20, four to 48 hours. So um, it was a real, um, it was wow. a real thing that people responded to. Yeah, they, they loved the idea. So now my big logistical issue is getting boxes. Um, <laughs> but we'll figure it out. Um, well, I'm so glad we had that conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it, it's fabulous. Um, and it's great because I'm able to write these like big checks to small businesses. Um, that support us and that, um, and you know, we can kind of give back to them a little bit. And then there is a profit margin for us, which is great. Um, and then we're going to add a nonprofit partner to that as well. So that each CSA style pickup, uh, will also have a charitable component. So it's sort of like is a trifecta of, of, uh, of making it work. <laughs> I absolutely love that. Well, thank you so much, Kate. I um, really you. appreciate your insights. And I want to remind everyone, Kate's sticking with us through the end. So if you have questions for her, I've saw a couple come in. Just pop them in the Q&A and we will get to those at the end. So now I'm going to throw it to Nate Riley um, at Three Magnets. Hi, Nate. Thanks so much for joining us. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, so Three Magnets is a brewery in Olympia and you also have a catering arm called Garden Movement, which is now really your primary online ordering operation. Um, you similarly got online ordering set up, you know, right in the nick of time, right before the dining ban in your state. Um, so I'd love if you could just walk us through um, what that experience was like yeah. uh, from, from the beginning of pivoting your business. Yeah, I mean, the pivoting was really, you know, in Washington is where it hit first. And I think a lot of us saw the writing on the wall. Um, and so I was probably trying to get, you know, started to research online ordering maybe a week before uh, and how we could deliver our beer to customers legally. And so I was talking with the, uh, the liquor control board about that and, uh, managed to get that all squared away pretty much the day before the dining band went into effect. So we were ready with online orders from day one. Um, it's still a huge learning process, um, you know, which items to cut off the menu so they don't go bad um, because the, the sell through rates so much lower, which items travel well and which ones are just going to be crap by the time they get home. Um, but we also knew that we were not going to be able to have a true delivery model. Um, we didn't have the type of food where you could just run it out uh, to four or five uh, different houses uh, while it just sat there and died. Um, and we certainly didn't think we could be able to afford to send employees back and forth, back and forth, back and forth each time somebody ordered, um, especially with how slow it was when we first started. So uh, we, we started right away. Um, I was really surprised gardenmovement.com was available. Um, it fits right in with our branding. Um, and we wanted it to turn into something that was uh, supporting local gardens um, in the community, because this is also a time when people are ordering from Whole Foods and Amazon and Fred Meyer and all the big grocery chains. Um, and they're all on like five to seven day waits anyways for groceries, it seems like. Um, but that leaves very little money re recycling in our community. Um, so we came up with the garden move. So we are actually our catering is something different. We just call that three mag catering. Um, so this was something we came up with uh, kind of independently as like a ready to cook meal delivery service. 
Um, and so basically we're gonna do three meals. Uh, we're hoping to start next week. We think we'll be able to start on Monday. Uh, we're gonna do a meatless Monday uh, every Monday. We're going to do a wholesome Wednesday every Wednesday, so we're kind of well-balanced. And then a fun Friday every Friday, which is just gonna be sliders or you know really fun stuff that's maybe not quite as healthy, but hey, it's Friday. Um, and then we have the added bonus of being able to tack on our canned beers with that. Um, and now local wines and local spirits as well, because uh, Washington State Liquor Control Board changed the laws to allow us to do that, uh, to try and get people to have to go out less. Um, so that's really cool. Um, so when we're putting this together, you know, first of all, we, we branded it Garden Movement by Three Magnets. Um, you know, we, our history, my wife and I, we used to have a Greasy Spoon breakfast restaurant. Uh, when we opened up the brewery, we, we, we love brunch. So we actually opened up a second breakfast restaurant within the brewery. Um, and it did pretty good on the weekends, but it just didn't get any weekdays traffic. And we just learned people don't really think of breweries when they think of breakfast. Um, so we actually had to close that down. And so we're thinking, okay, well, it's a meal delivery service. Are people going to think of breweries for a meal delivery service? Um, and so we felt like it had to have its own kind of branding and something that spoke to kind of what the goal of it was. Um, and so it's just garden movement by three magnets is, is what we're doing with that. Um, but it's, it's not our menu items at all. It's a completely different revenue stream because we are not confident that we're gonna come up to 100% on curbside. I think we're about, 60 to 70 percent right now on the weekdays but you know we've got a huge patio and we just can't come anywhere close to our friday saturday sunday business of last year uh you know we're like 75 percent down on those days because there's no patio business um and so you know we knew it would take multiple revenue streams if we're going to pay for you know a 200 seat restaurant with zero seats being used um so a lot of the garden movement um, to make it more appealing is that we're not just delivering these meals, um, but we do have add-ons. Uh, so we have a lot of grocery items that we're starting to bring into inventory right now. Um, and then we've got a lot of local items as well. So local specialty items, um, you know, locally made sauerkraut. Um, we actually have a letterpress uh, friend of ours who has a letterpress business who's pretty well known in the community and she's got no work right now because um, people aren't printing things. And so she's actually making really nice, inspiring cards. Some of them are kind of funny. Some of them are heartwarming. Um, and they're going to come with a pack of five. Uh, they're going to have five envelopes that are stamped already and ready to go out because people have time to write letters right now. And we're going to start with volume one. And we're going to sell until those are gone. And then we'll add volume two to the store. And there'll be a whole new set of fun cards. So we're trying to think outside of the box to uh, keep the excitement around the project. Um, and, and of course, the more local people that we bring in, the more people are pointing, oh, this is where you can where you can get my stuff. And so the more people are being directed to our website. So we're certainly not trying to be a one size fits all. There's going to be certain staples that we just won't have. Maybe we can't source them cheap enough to be able to give a reasonable price. Um, and then there's gonna be just weird things like, why would somebody want that? But hey, it might sell. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what we're doing there. Cool, um, I love it. We are going to be bringing in a subscription service too, uh, so people can subscribe to the meals and add on certain staples that they want to get every single week with their meals. Uh, we're going to wait about a month or so and work out the kinks of just the, the delivery service first. But uh, I, I think the subscription service is really where you can start to build that clientele. That's really exciting. I if you could walk me through initially how you got set up, how you chose to do this with Upserve Online Ordering, um, and how that all works from a tech for you. Yeah, so I, I think I, I filled out the form to sign up for it, or maybe I spoke with someone. I don't, I don't recall which it was, and then they were, it was going to be uh, set up for me. I believe when I did it, it was maybe within 48 hours. And I was like, no, I want to do it now. And so I just went in there and I started poking around and probably took me less than an hour just to figure out how to set it up. And then, of course, there was a lot of changing around the, the, the menu items, figuring out what categories to put in. And, and that was probably a, you know, a day long process almost. Um, and and uh, like, like Katie said, there's a lot of like I'm on my computer every 10 minutes changing something, you know, uh, changing the inventory of something. Oh, shoot, we forgot to change a special from last night. And now someone ordered the special today. Um, so a lot, a, lot of, a lot of, you know, snags that are on our side operationally because we're kind of put, you know, making up these processes on the fly. 
Talk to me about the community building movement you're doing uh, where you're donating to local organizations through your online ordering menu. Yeah, so it's actually the, the customers are doing the donating and, and we're trying to be very transparent with that, that we are making money off of this too. Um, it all started out when a local church, um, so we're kitty corner from a, a shelter and actually we were very uh, vocal when they came in. A lot of our neighbors did not want them to come in. Um, and uh, you know, we, we kind of were, uh, kind of went on it with this, uh, we can't have this not in my backyard attitude, like we need to be part of the solution. We can't just tell them they can't be here. So we've had a really good relationship with them. And a local church had asked if they could purchase 80 meals for them for 10 bucks a piece because they, their volunteers are older and they couldn't safely bring the meals down or prepare the meals. And it just kind of got our wheels moving and we thought, you know, we'll, we'll add a $10 box meal uh, for Interfaith Works and we'll, we'll see what happens. We might sell 10 a week, maybe we'll sell 20 a week. You know, once we get up to like 50 or 100, then we'll deliver those in one, one big uh, drop. But we've actually been averaging over 100 a week. We're probably at about 600 meals now in about four weeks. And uh, it's, it's kind of crazy because it's definitely helping us keep the doors open, but it's also feeding a lot of people, so. That's just really, really awesome. It's so exciting to hear those stories yeah. uh, coming out of this crisis. Um, and I'd love if you could share, you know, I know we talked about this, but why you went with a proprietary uh, online ordering platform like Upserve instead of using a third party like Seamless or Grubhub. Nate, I think you're maybe frozen. Did we lose you? I think we might've lost him. <laughs> Technical difficulties. That's okay. We will pick back up with Dave. I'm not when sure you... if you can hear oh. me right now. It's it's locked up on you. Oh. Sorry about that, folks. Technical difficulties over here. Um, Nate, can you hear me? Nate. All right, well, uh, I can't hear Nate right now. Um, so we will circle back with him, but I'd love if we could throw to Donald um, and kind of shift our focus from online ordering to recovery. Um, Donald has been working with restaurants across the country. He has his own series of webinars where he's been coaching folks to get ready to reopen their restaurants. So Donald, I'd love if you could tell us what you're hearing in the industry uh, and how you're preparing folks for what comes next. Well, first I want to say, you know, shout out to, you know, Katie and Nate. I mean, man, way to like recover quick and pivot. I mean, oh, on a I'm dime. Not. I mean, that's pretty awesome. And, uh, you know, the, the theme I hear from both of those, the two underlying themes is number one, you got to be creative. And number two, you got to, you got to reach out to your community. This is about community. This is where, that whole getting around the table and breaking bread really comes together. And if you're a restaurant, you need to really reach out to your community as best you can. So the thing I'm seeing right now, um, of course, fear, doubt, uncertainty, but those things are usually to me are, I hate to say it's all, you know, fear is one of those things that, you know, we have to be aware of. And if you look at the, actually the Chinese word for crisis, it's actually made of two characters. The character, one character is danger and the other one's opportunity. And if we look at what this is, this is right now, it is, it is a crisis. There is danger. I mean, COVID-19 is real. It is, it is, you know, it does, it is fatal, but there's also a huge opportunity here. And if we look at and focus on, <laughs> on the opportunity, I think we can pull together and recover faster from this. What you tend to focus on, you tend to feel. So if you focus on the fear and the doubt and the uncertainty, you're going to get a lot more of that. But if you're like, you know, Katie and Nate, and you focus on the opportunity here and how can we help, and you come from that kind of place in your heart that I want to be a part of my community, I want to help my community, I want to serve people, and I want to, you know, do what I can, then I think, you know, and you've seen some exam great examples here that people definitely, you know, do actually, um, you know, are making it through this. So I kind of so have like, can, oh, sorry, oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. No, I was gonna, I was gonna go to your checklist, which I think is what you were heading towards next. Yeah, which, which one? 
I have a couple checklists. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Uh, but yeah, I would love to hear, you know, one, how you're coaching folks through what to do right now if they're mm -hmm. closed, if they're open, how to stay open. Um, talk to me about that. Okay, right now, um, right now, mostly I'm working with restaurants that are either, um, you know, they're closed and doing takeout and delivery, which is a great thing. And, and here's the thing about takeout and delivery. If you did not really have, you know, a big takeout and delivery kind of platform or revenue stream before, you're going to see like Katie has that, you know, this is huge and we're not going to stop this when this thing gets going again. In fact, you're going to, you want to keep this thing amped up and ramped up because, I've been putting out some polls on social media and I've been asking people just a random question. Like if restaurants were allowed to open their dining rooms May 1st, would you go and dine in a dining room in a restaurant? And I'm telling you right now, 60% said no. You know, 40% said yes, 60% are saying no. So people will still have that fear, doubt and uncertainty. So even though we might be able to open up our dining rooms, doesn't mean that we, we can back to our full capacity. In fact, there's probably gonna be lots of regulations and rules about social distancing. You probably have to take out some tables. So you wanna keep this delivery and takeout, you wanna keep it amped up. I mean, cause it's gonna be a huge revenue stream for all restaurants after this thing. It's actually gonna be a new revenue stream for a lot of places. I'm, I'm sure Katie's not gonna take her foot off the pedal on this thing from now on. She's gonna keep her, keeping the foot down on this thing and keep this thing kind of amped up. She'll probably more for a little bit more, but she wants to keep this thing kind of amped up. So the first thing, I always say with everyone is define your reality. Where are you right now? Where is your restaurant right now? And that kind of, I, I call it kind of the, and if we can break it down into three steps, it's ready, aim, fire. So the ready stage, you know, where am I? And I really, because anytime I'm going to take a journey, I have to be clear on, on where I am. And the first thing we always do is I always have them take out a piece of paper, draw a piece of a line right down the middle and say on one side, you write your assets. And the other side, write down your liabilities. Now, things that could have been assets before might be liabilities now. So you had a huge menu and you had, you know, 70 items on your menu. Before, that could have been a huge asset as a differential in your market because you had a lot of opportunity, a lot of options for people. And you were kind of like that place that had something for everyone. But now, that could be a huge liability. <laughs> a lot more inventory, a lot more staffing, a lot more labor, you know I mean? it gets to be a nightmare. So you really want to take down that asset and liability and then really kind of really determine which one goes on which side of the, of the line. Okay. Once you get that down, you really want to, you know, again, reach out to your vendors and everyone here has talked about reaching out to your vendors. Vendors right now are feeling the same crush you are as a restaurant owner. And I, I work, I do consulting for food service companies and they are feeling the blow. I mean, sometimes worse than you. Um, they are sitting on tons of product that they need to move. And if they don't move it, they have to dump it, especially produce. I mean, I know a food service company in the Southwest that just last week alone dumped like in one warehouse alone, dumped like over $350,000 of produce. And that's a lot of produce. <laughs> but if you reach out to them and say, Hey, listen, we're doing some community stuff. I want to feed people. I want to help people. I want to make sure I'm getting stuff out to my community. They're more than willing to help you you know, and a partner with you. Like Katie's reached out to people, you know, with the, with the, with the, you know, the fish, the fishmongers and stuff like that. You have to reach out to people. You have to ask. Don't be afraid to ask for help. That's the number one thing. I think most of the times as independent restaurant owners, we think we have to go it alone. You know, we're tough. I don't have to ask, you know, I don't need anybody's help. And we've all kind of had this kind of self kind of silo thing that we've kind of isolated ourselves. It's me against everybody else in my market. No. Now it's us as a community trying to save ourselves as a community. So, and like Katie does and like Nate does, has done, reach out to people in your community and reach out to your food vendors, reach out to those little mom and pop places down the street, reach out to your local baker. You know, what are they doing? You got some extra product I can use. You got some bread that didn't get used. Could I, could I get it for you a real discount and I can make bread pudding and I can use that bread pudding to feed people. I mean, come on, there's tons of stuff you can do. So be creative and reach out to your vendors. The next thing you want to do is you want to reevaluate your team. Now I'm going to, I'm going to throw this out there and people are going to maybe get mad at this statement, but I'm going to throw it out there anyway. <laughs> COVID-19 is not your fault, 
but how you ran your restaurant before COVID-19 is your fault. So that being said, there are probably some things that you should have done better. And we all have a list of things we should do. You know, I should cost out my menu. I should market more. I should fire that negative energy vampire that's sucking the life out of me and my business. But, oh, you know, I just don't have the heart to do it. Well, you know, you got to turn those shoulds into a must. Most restaurant owners, and I'll say probably 90% of them, they just should all over themselves, you know, every day. Should, 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 should. You got to turn that should into a must. And now is a perfect time. It's a perfect reset button. Like I said, opportunity. COVID-19 gave you an opportunity right now. So <laughs> you should be looking at everything and analyzing, again, assets, liabilities. What, who on my team has really been an asset? And actually, and be honest, who's been a liability? Up until COVID-19, one of the, was the biggest thing everyone complained about? Oh, there's no good help, hard to find people, too many restaurants. That problem's gonna be solved very quick. <laughs> there's not gonna be that many restaurants. In fact, I'm estimating 25 to 30% will not open their doors again after this is over. That's a lot of restaurants. That's a lot of people going out in the market. Now, some people might not return to the restaurant industry, but still, there are going to be a lot of people out there looking for jobs. There's going to be a lot of really good people, a lot of A-talent out there looking for jobs. So if you have the means right now, you should start putting out feelers and start looking for people. If you're looking for a new opportunity, you know, I would start recruiting kind of a little bit now because I want to be ahead of the curve when this thing does kind of lighten up and we do get a chance to reopen because whenever they give the go ahead, I know like in Atlanta, I mean, Georgia, they're reopening on Friday. Did you hear that? I mean, it's crazy. I mean, <laughs> I mean it's, like, it's, it's, it's drawn a huge kind of controversy. Atlanta's like, yeah, we're opening, reopening restaurants and everything on Friday. And half the, half the, half the state's like, yeah. The other half's like, oh no. And everyone's like in panic mode. So when you do get a chance to reopen, what you want to do is be careful because not everyone's going to embrace it with open arms. So take it easy, take it slow you know, reach out to those vendors. And also to, you know, keep those gift cards going. You want to really be creative with that stuff. I mean, every year we usually do that Black Friday sale. You know, every, and I have a client actually in Louisiana. And this is, this is the truth. Between Friday, now I have two restaurants in Baton Rouge. Between Friday and Monday, Black Friday and Cyber Monday, they sell every year a million dollars in gift cards. That's a lot of gift cards. But why couldn't you do um, something right now that could basically, you know, do a stimulus sale, you know, and, and I heard some people calling them restaurant bonds and things like that, but you know, it's the same thing. Do some restaurant bonds and stuff like that. Get some cash flow going though for you. And then also too, what you want to do in this kind of ready stage is I want to start, you know, and, and some people have already done it, is start looking at potential revenue streams. You know, because you don't want to be caught with your pants down again like this thing. <laughs> we had all our eggs in one basket. What happens when that basket gets dried up? You know, I always love the word, you know, revenue streams because I have multiple revenue streams. I have my on, I have my books, of course. I have my online courses. I have my coaching clients. I have my mastermind groups. I have, you know, my speaking engagements I do. So if any one kind of dries up, like right now, all my clients dried up, totally gone. <laughs> but then all I've done is I just switched to more of an online platform and now my mastermind group has just taken off. So there's always opportunity if you're willing to look at different revenue streams. You know, maybe, you know, meal replacement is your thing. Maybe doing cooking classes could be a thing you could do. Maybe you could do an online cooking class subscription where people could be members. And I was thinking about, I was talking to this someone the other day, is like, you have the ingredients, they come by your restaurant, pick up the ingredients, and then they go home and get onto a private YouTube channel and you walk them through how to cook the dish. I mean, tons of stuff, you gotta get creative. I love and, it. Yeah. And then of course, you know, revamping your menu. I think both Katie and Nate have realized that there's some things I just got to revamp. You know, I have to take off the menu. And the thing I love about Upserve has so many great tools in there. If you use them again, that goes back to that thing about shooting. <laughs> Most people treat their POS system like a fancy cash register. It does so much more. It does so much more. And then you got great tools like seven shifts too, help you dial in your labor. It's gonna help you kind of dial in what your labor budget should be. So you don't get kind of caught with your pants down. 
but also, you know, dialing in those menu engineering tools, telling you what your, you know, your stars are on the menu, telling you what your inventory is, so you know, all the time. I'm always shocked and appalled <laughs> simultaneously. Whenever I speak to, whenever I speak to audiences, it doesn't matter if I'm speaking to a crowd of a hundred or like if I'm in Madrid speaking to a thousand people, I ask them all the same question. How many, and I always say, raise your hand. How many people know everything on your menu costs it down to the penny? 5% of a crowd raises their hand. That's so sad. You have such great tools, especially with Upserve. You have such great resources with so many of the things they have on their websites that are free. <laughs> you have to pick it up. There's a great saying I hear a lot, knowledge is power. Knowledge is not power. Knowledge is just potential. It's like any kind of tool. A hammer on the table is just potential. It doesn't really do anything until I pick it up and use it. So communicate with your vendors. That's the ready part. Aim. Once you kind of get this thing, you want to get a plan down. You want to get, you know, that menu revamped. I want to have an outreach for my thing. I want to have my safety protocols in place for when I'm going to reopen. That's my aim. And I always figure out where's my gap, where I'm at now, where I want to be, and what's the gap between to get me there. And then the last part is fire, which means taking action. You got to put this stuff into play. You have to take action every day. Again, there's so many things that we can reset. So many of us have a lot of bad habits. It's time to kind of take some inventory of ourselves and really work on doing some new habits and things like that. I was seeing someone, oh, someone in the, on the list right now said they've been doing wine dinners during Zoom. They pick up the food and wine and then they do a Zoom thing for everyone. I mean, that's, I see, that's creative stuff. You know, try to get creative with everything. And then again, once it's ready to reopen, be ready and be positive. As the leader of your organization, as the leader of your team, the team takes their kind of direction and they take their energy from you. If you're positive, upbeat, and optimistic, your team will be. If you're full of fear, doubt, and uncertainty, your team will be. One of the things I say in all my books, culture flows down, it doesn't flow up. And culture starts with you. So right now is the time to re-examine yourself. Who are you as a leader? Who do you wanna be as a leader? And now's the time to, you know, especially you got a little downtime, now it's the time to work on yourself and make yourself a better person. That's my rant. <laughs> Thank you so much, Donald. That was really, really helpful. I think, you know, we've been working with you for a long time and you've always had great intel. And I think right now restaurants need it more than ever. Um, we have a ton of questions in the chat and in the Q&A. So I want to give folks another opportunity if you have questions for Katie or Donald or Nate, who I think we have back. Nate, let me see. Can you hear me, Nate? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Great. So glad to have you back. Okay, great. So get your uh, questions in the Q&A or in the chat. Um, I'm going to do another quick poll. Um, are you currently using Olo online ordering for your restaurant right now? Just curious. Looks like most of you are not. I'll give it a couple more seconds. Are you using online ordering at your restaurant today? So no, 78%. Wow. Um, so, so you know, obviously a, a lot, a lot to learn here, a lot to, a lot to get started with. Uh, and then I think we have one more poll question. Oh, if you are using online ordering for the folks that said yes, what are you using? Are you taking orders over the phone or via email? Um, are you using Upserve online ordering? Uh, are you using another POS's online ordering platform or are you using a third party app like Grubhub, Seamless, Uber Eats, Caviar, etc.? Give folks a couple more seconds to add to the poll. All right, I'm going to let. So it looks like most of you are using a mix of phone and email or third party apps. All right, thank you for sharing that with us. Um, so we're gonna go back into our deck just to kind of rehash you know, what we were discussing with our amazing panelists. We have some best practices for pivoting to online ordering. 
um, as it seems most of you have not started. So one of the things we want you to really take into consideration is how to choose your online ordering provider. Um, as it's come up before, third-party providers like Grubhub, Caviar, Uber Eats, commission fees up to 35%. And if you're already operating on really slim margins, that's not gonna work out for you. It's gonna eat into uh, a lot of your bottom line, no pun intended. Um, also, there was a recent survey from US Foods that saw that 28% of third-party delivery drivers admit that they steal food from order. And that's where you get into you know, bad reviews and a he said, she said with your customers saying their food never arrived. Um, we've heard this from a lot of our customers that they've had issues with uh, third-party apps and missing food. So definitely something to think about. Um, but you know, if you are doing delivery and bringing that in-house, that means you need to staff up your delivery function. So we've seen a lot of our restaurants uh, have their servers delivering food um, by bike or by car, um, or just doing you know, curbside takeout, pickup. Um, so you wanna consider all of that before you get started. Um, you are also gonna need to update your website. It's really important that folks can find you when they're searching for you know, restaurants near me, Mexican food in Boston, Chinese food in New York City. Um, so you wanna make sure your website is SEO optimized for those search engines. Um, you wanna add photos to your website and your menu where possible, the type of cuisine, your location data, and then make sure it's really clear that A, you are open for delivery and takeout, and B, what hours you are open so folks can take advantage of that. And a lot of people have been asking, we're gonna share all these slides and this webinar with everyone who signed up. Um, so you know, don't feel like you need to take notes or anything. We will be sharing this after. Um, another key piece that we didn't really get into that much, but that I know Katie and Nate are crushing it at, and I have some examples here, is advertising on social. It's really important to build those connections with your community, as so many people said today, and to keep your, your online audience aware of what's going on. So you want to post as frequently as possible, especially your, your menu and your specials. Um, incentivize your followers to share that you are doing delivery, you're doing takeout, you're open for business. Uh, and show behind the scenes activities, even if you're not open, you could show the prep work that you're doing on a new recipe or maybe some renovations you're doing in the restaurant. Just keep that line of communication open. Uh, if we go to the next slide, we have some examples of three magnets. Uh, so on the, on the left, you have them delivering food to the nonprofit there earlier um, and some specials uh, that they're on Instagram and Facebook. So doing a really great job of making sure folks know that they're open for business, what they have on the menu, uh, getting them excited about coming in. I don't know about you guys, these dishes are making me very hungry right now. Um, showing folks some behind the scenes, some of your personality, all the things they love about you and your restaurant uh, will make them want to patronize you and get that takeout. Another thing you want to, we talked about this a little bit, customizing your menu. So how do you identify the low cost, high popularity dishes that can help you streamline your menu? You wanna take advantage of what you already have in house, what's lower cost in terms of inventory. Uh, and another thing we didn't really get a chance to touch on, but thinking about family style meals, um, you know, what can someone order with one click for four people? That'll also help drive up you know, your total revenues if they're ordering larger ticket items. Um, so something to think about there versus having someone you know, have to consider ordering an individual meal for each person in their family. Uh, you also wanna offer discounts and promos either for first time orders or for your most loyal customers um, or offering a promo off a certain size order. So you know, when you spend $50, you get $10 off, that will help drive up your revenue as well. Uh, and another thing to keep in mind, bringing hospitality to the takeout experience. You all got into this business, love to provide exceptional hospitality, and don't let that end because folks aren't coming into your restaurant. So think about, you know, how do you add a personal note? How do you add, maybe, maybe it's a roll of toilet paper. Um, you know, consider how the food arrives in the takeout containers. Really think about that whole end-to-end -end experience, even though it's outside of your restaurant. And then as we heard from our guests today, always be pivoting. What else can you offer your guests that also supports your restaurant community, uh, supports nonprofits in your community, or supports you know, the providers in your community by doing a CSA box or produce or supplies? Um, there's so many options that you can use that can also help you drive revenue. Uh, so we have Emily from Seven Shifts who's gonna walk us how to think about examining your labor and food costs. Yeah, so I guess um, 
from looking at a lot of our uh, successful customers, what we're seeing as a trend is really looking at uh, hours of operation and understanding how to maximize those. So a lot of people have noticed that, you know, there's a shift on when people are delivering food versus when they would have dined in. So it's really kind of with a magnifying glass, like understanding when those calls or those online orderings um, are happening. And actually you can condense it. People, you know, will get their order in by six o'clock if you tell them to. So you actually really own this, um, this supply and demand chain. And also understanding that you might have to shift. You know, if you were doing brunch and eggs don't really carry that well, you know, we, ha we have a local um, brunch place that now it's, it's, they're a dinner and they're not doing eggs anymore. And they're just, you know, trying different things. And also healthcare workers, we're seeing a lot of people shift to do like late night runs, you know, for hospitals, right? So just the, the current situation being really um, courageous and, and just, you know, changing things up. The other thing we're noticing is um, not to be afraid of increasing food prices. So people, like we heard from Katie um, and kind of across the board is like, people wanna help. And what can you really control? It's how much you're charging for your items, right? And, and be really transparent, you know, also like food costs different than what it does. Delivery service costs different. So just be like, just know that uh, if you're transparent, people are willing to, to pay for what you're doing. And, uh, Harvard Business Review just found like, you know, in between the 20 and 25%, um, there's not a big pushback. People won't even notice, right? But at the end of the day, that's money that you're bringing into your restaurant. And then lastly, we're really noticing this push and focus to integrate systems, right? So whether, you know, you have different tasks now, people need to wash their hands and hygiene um, is very different. So what, you know, task management systems are you using to integrate? Do you have, in, you know, your inventory is different, supply chain in terms of your takeout um, boxes, uh, online ordering, obviously, you know, payroll, hiring. What does hiring look like when sales come back up? How are you getting your great people back? Or how are you communicating to your staff, right? You don't want people to be ghosted. You still want to be communicating, even if you don't have all the answers. And then of course your POS and your sales. So using this time to really kind of maximize your efficiencies and operations. And basically the more data you have, the smarter business choices you can make. Great, thank you so much, Emily. Um, and, you know, finally, as Donald was saying, you want to start rethinking about reopening, right? So update those job descriptions, dust off your training materials, analyze your labor costs. Um, and like he said before, keep communicating with your community. Keep that line of communication open, whether you are open or not. Uh, and then finally, you know, brush up on your marketing. Uh, if you have some downtime, tinker with your website, make some new images for social, and then dig into your P&L. Um, you know, better manage your food costs, revamp your menu, and widen your margins. Um, well, I am so grateful all of you joined us today. We're gonna get to the Q&A shortly. We're a little over time, but I wanted Emily to quickly talk about an offer that Seven Shifts is doing just for Upserve. Yeah, I'll make this short and sweet. Um, basically, the team at Seven Shifts uh, wants to offer four months free. So this is an opportunity for you to look at, you know, task management, your schedule, create open shifts for your customers. You know, maybe your staff is now doing some delivery. So um, usually it's, you know, one month free. But here we know that it might take a little bit more time for you to, you know, get in there, play around and see how it can be of use to you. So there's a link down there. And um, yeah, go, go sign up and try. This is for you. Great, and for all of you folks uh, who are joining us now who are not doing online ordering, Upserve is offering free online ordering for a year. Free online ordering and restaurant management tools. You do not even need to have uh, our hardware. You can use your own iPad. Um, so you could you know, start, sign up today. We will get you up and running super fast. We're also doing an offer right now where we will do free Facebook ads for you. We will make a Facebook ad and put $100 against it in the three mile radius of your restaurant so folks can start ordering online and know that you are doing uh, online ordering and takeout. So um, if you're interested in this, head over to upserve.com. You'll see a little pop up there. I will also send you an email about this, but it's a great offer. Really want to give back to our restaurant community. And we know online ordering is really the lifeline of the restaurant industry right now. So to get 12 months of online ordering for free, head over to upserve.com and we will get you set up. All right, we have lots of questions. So without further ado, I wanna dig into these. Um, and again, for those of you who may have missed it, we're gonna send this presentation, this video to everyone who signed up. So if you missed the beginning or if you missed some slides, we're gonna send everything to you. Uh, don't worry about it, we will get you all set up. 
Uh, so we have a question from Ian at Little Creek Oysters in New York. Hi, Ian. I'm also in New York. Similar size restaurant to Bywater. We've spent the last few years really drilling down on getting rid of single use plastic, et cetera. And now we're looking at starting takeout. Of course, this is a pivot. How is the cost of packaging factored in and how have you gotten feedback from customers? Katie and Nate, do you want to talk about packaging and, and avoiding plastic? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sure Nate has a better or more thorough answer because it seems like his, his project is a bigger in scope. So he's probably dealing with a lot more packaging issues. But for us, um, it is kind of funny because, you know, my community is definitely like, you know, the people who got on board with the whole, like, no single use straw campaign kind of thing. And then we've heard crickets about to go items. Um, I think because everyone's just like, we can only focus on one crisis at a time. The whales will be fine. Um, or not whales, what was it? Turtles. Uh, but anyway, we've actually been able to, for the most part, just use like recycled um, craft paper bags and recycled to-go boxes that don't have enough of a waxy coating to prevent them being recycled by the consumer. Um, so for the most part, I mean, they're not hideously expensive and we are able to get them from a variety of sources. So, um, you know, I can kind of keep cost comparing, which I do like all the time, like every day. I'm like, what's the price of this like stupid to-go box thingy? Um, I have to say, I would, you know, unlike what Donald was recommending, I didn't like sit down and plug the to-go cost right in. I just kind of assumed, okay, it's going to cost us a couple dollars more per order per thing. So let's just like build that in. Um, and so I think we were probably right. It is a, it is a couple dollars now that I've seen um, the invoices come in. Um, but also, uh, like Emily said, people do not notice a little bit of a price increase here or there. So one of the ways we were able to kind of take that off the top is we left a lot of our appetizer pricing um, kind of the same for to-go, like um, even though the, the portions might have scaled down a little bit um, and we're not having, you know, some of the other overhead costs. So we kept, you know, rather high pricing on some of the appetizers and then, you know, we were able to kind of lower pricing on some of the higher priced entrees, things that were in like the high 20s and 30 ranges. Um, and so that all kind of averaged out um, to the point now where it's like, okay, I, I feel comfortable now with people. Um, that I, I feel like my, my customer is subsidizing the cost of the to-go stuff now. Um, but that being said, we don't really offer utensils too much. We have some like compostable bamboo stuff that we, or not bamboo, whatever it is, that we can send with people when they want to like go to a picnic or something. But for the most part, people are just, you know, curbside in the car going home. So we haven't had to worry too much about other things. Yeah, we um, we are uh, ocean friendly restaurant uh, certified from the Surf Riders Foundation, which came with a, a lot of um, you know stipulations and things that we would agree you know to, to to do you know. So we spent some time kind of finding ways to source up their products, and and unfortunately some of that is out the window. I mean our to go boxes are still recyclable. We still have like compostable plastic silverware, but almost no one's taking that anyways because they're taking their food home to eat. Um, but you know, we found we had to go away from the little cups for sauces. We didn't have lids for them, um, and we haven't had time to really try and source uh, other stuff. Um, and I'm, I'm sure it's out there. Uh, it's just not we haven't gotten that far yet. Uh, for us, it would be worth paying the extra costs for that because it it does um, kind of go with our values that people are accustomed to seeing from us. Um, another thing, my you know, my wife and I uh, a year ago we spearheaded an effort to do away with mandatory glove use. Uh, because we, it's, it's just horrible on the environment and it's just dumb. Um, and so we, we made some progress with the Washington Hospitality Association, the Tom Douglas group up in Seattle. They kind of took the lead on that after we started it because they've got a lot more clout. And they kind of got to the point where the health department was going to allow people to have, you know, better hand washing procedures uh, in training programs. Uh, in agreeance to not having to use gloves anymore. And now, unfortunately, I think that's like, it hadn't started yet and I think it's completely out the window. And, and of course, we're using a ton of gloves, you know. Um, we know how to wash off, you know, bacteria pretty darn well. Uh, the virus is just a different beast, you know. So again, we had to put that on pause. Hopefully we can, you know, make an effort towards that again in the future, so. So we have another question about packaging. Uh, somebody, uh, Rachel wants to know about packaging staples. If you're doing a CSA box, what's a safe way to sell staple items in the public with to-go food? So let me answer that one because I'm really doing like not so much of that. Yeah, we haven't started much of that stuff yet. So we're not, I mean, as far as like putting a roll of toilet paper in the same bag as 
uh, to go food? Is that the question? Uh, I think it's just, you know, if you're, if you're doing staples in addition to traditional like takeout meals, how you're packaging them. Maybe it's more like I, well, they're saying a safe way. So maybe it's like thinking about uh, like poultry or something that could go bad, I guess. We're actually working on getting a refrigerated truck for our deliveries. Um, and we hope to have that in the next couple of weeks, um, get, get one leased. Um, and so that, that's our plan is to deliver everything at once, fill up the truck uh, between two and six o'clock uh, and then run it around. Um, so we don't have to worry about things heating up. Um, and then as far as raw poultry, I mean, you know, our initial plan was just to use Ziploc bags on, on, on the bigger portions that we have if we are going to sell things like raw meat. Um, but we also think we might have to sell those frozen uh, just to make sure that they sell before they go bad. I would say too, if you're worried about it, um, reach out to your local Department of Health because I've found that they're incredibly happy to work with restaurants that are trying to you know, shift their business model and do new things and they want to be as accommodating as possible. So if you're worried that you may not have a system set up that um, is safe enough or is conforming enough, I just reach out to Department of Health and, and they can give you some guidelines. Great, another question. How many specials or menus should your restaurant be running at once? Ours is doing a fresh market uh, a weekend dinner package, packages for two or four daily, percentage off wines, and regular takeout menu. I feel like it may be overkill, and I'm looking for some best practices to present to my owner to eliminate the confusion for our guests. Great question. Yeah, this could um, start anywhere. Number one, I would say, like, well, number one, how many, well, how big is your menu now, and how big is your restaurant? How big is your kitchen? You know, you don't want to, there, there's a thing in menu design, we, I call it paradox of choice. Too many options become overwhelming for people. And I, I use the analogy of the Rolling Stones. The Rolling Stones recorded 473 songs, but when you go to a Stones concert, you don't want to hear 470 B-side, you know, things that crap. You want to hear the hits. So your menu should always be your greatest hits. Now with takeout and to go, we also have to consider does the stuff travel well? You know, so when I'm looking at menus now, especially for delivery and takeout, I'm also looking at a number is my greatest hit, but also is it something that I'm going to be proud of if it gets into a box and travels 15, 20 minutes to someone's house? Katie, you want to add? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I look at it from also um, just like the perspective of the bandwidth of your customer, which I think the question was about as well. It's like, you know, how much can they process? And, you know, there is a restaurant um, in my area that I see that they post like daily specials that always have a theme. And I could, and I would love to order from them and they make delicious food, but I could never in a million years keep track of all that. Right. Um, and I think too, if you think about the Instagram algorithm, if you post something successful, Instagram is going to show that for like 48 hours, maybe even longer if it's like a viral, you know, if it's a good post. So I kind of think that, you know, when I'm rolling out stuff, I can maybe tell my guests something important like three maybe four times a week mm -hmm. if i'm if i'm telling them anything else it's got to be this like filler like good feel good content but i think i can tell them important stuff like three or four times a week <laughs> right and, and i have a couple clients that are doing takeout and they're just doing like one special item like friday night doing prime rib yeah. smoked prime rib on friday night we're doing you know fried chicken sunday fried chicken family dinners on sunday but it's just one item and they're, and they're not, you know, stacking them together every night of the week. They're pacing them out. So people, mm -hmm. you, you figure this too. Someone's going to take it to, you know, something to go from your restaurant. They're going to take it and they're going to actually probably use it for a day or two. It's not just like, yeah. you know, so. We have a couple questions about how the Upserve online ordering platform works. So I just wanted to dig through those. Uh, Joshua asked if you can attach images and menu items uh, and full ingredients list. So you can attach images. We encourage it. Um, helps folks order, makes your food look more appetizing. Um, and then you can list the ingredients. We do have a character limit, so you can't write a whole novel, but you can include ingredients. Um, we had another question about the ability to directly contact guests after they place an order. Um, so the system automatically contacts them in terms of their order being accepted and when their order will be ready. Um, I know that Nate has a workaround where he's been messaging customers directly through iMessage. Um, to tell them, you know, where to park and where to pull up. 
Um, and then uh, Lori Solomon asks, can you add modifications for guests when they order if they have an allergy or dietary restriction? Absolutely. So the same way in your POS, you would add mods for your servers. Um, you can also add public facing modifications. So folks can say, you know, no sauce, extra sauce, um, this type of allergy, et cetera. Um, and then Heron asked, does online ordering allow for discounts and promos? Um, so Upserve is actually working on this now, exclusive Intel. We will have promo codes very, very soon. So look out for a message in the next two weeks. Um, but we will have that available for you. And then someone else wanted to know, is Upserve online ordering able to take future orders? Uh, we have a lot of people who order their Saturday meal on Thursday for delivery on Saturday. Yes, you can absolutely do that. And we're actually working on making that go out even farther. I think right now it's, you can order up to two weeks in advance. Um, but we're actually working on doing um, special ordering for special occasions like Easter or Christmas. If you do like a special, you know, Christmas meal or Thanksgiving meal. Um, so we're working that too. Uh, Cash One says, what are the costs of Olo through Upserve normally or after the 12 months? It depends on your solution, whether you have our uh, core solution or premium solution. I'm going to turn my video off because I'm getting an unstable internet connection message, uh, but I'm um, so it's free for 12 months and then you could switch to whatever price solution works for you. Um, let me see what else we have here. Um, when it's time to reopen, should your scaled down menu that is used for online ordering stay scaled down for both online and dine-in service? Donald, anyone have thoughts about this? What was the question again? Oh, sorry. <laughs> when it's time to reopen. To find them up here. Mike. There's like so many of them. Yeah. When it's time to reopen, should your scaled down menu for online ordering stay scaled down uh, for both online and dine-in service? Yes. So a question about how you transition your menu. Yeah. So your menu should be scaled down when you reopen because number one, you're not going to go back to normal. So let's think about this way. And here's some numbers you probably want to run for yourself. So if you have to reopen, when you get to a chance to reopen, you're probably going to have social distancing, you know, mandates. So let's say you have 100 seats. You're going to have to take out probably 30%, right? So you take out 30%. Now you're down to 70 seats. Now, honestly, how many people are going to come back to your restaurant? Maybe 50%. So now you got to think of your guest counts even lower. So you don't want to go back to having a, you know, a full blown menu and having things crazy. You want to ease back into it. And I and just think of it just like when you opened your restaurant for the first time, you want to start with a small menu that's doable. That's your team can execute that, you know, our home runs that every time it goes out, it's going to be fantastic. But also too, you want to now keep in mind in the back of your head is like everything that's on my menu that people may be having in my restaurant when I reopen and people are eating in, are they going to be able to take that on, on taking it out? And will it look the same? So I'm also looking at my staffing too. And this is where like seven shifts is great because you want to start, you know, putting out new job models. So these are the things you should be doing now before you reopen is I'm making new menu ideas, you know, and maybe I have a, you know, aggressive menu down in the future, like by end of summer, it's going to be great, but I'm not going to roll out that whole thing. I'm going to make this really small containable. And if you don't think there's power in a small menu, anybody ever been to, in and out Burger, I mean, <laughs> in and out Burger is big on the West Coast. They have like six items. You can get a double, a cheeseburger and a hamburger, shot, you know, fries and a shake and a, and a soda. That's it. And it's been that way since the 50s. And they do very, very well. So don't think there's not power. If you do something, you do it really well, people will come for it. You don't have to keep giving them new stuff and keep being innovative. I think sometimes owners, we try to innovate just for the sake that we're bored especially you know, I have a chef background and I know being a, a, I always say being a recovering chef, you know, I try to re, I try to, you know, want to be creative just for the chance of being creative, just to show I can do this, I can do that. But your guests tend to come back. And that's why also tapping into Upserve and tapping into those, you know, those reports on your POS system are so huge to find out really what people are ordering because we always have this kind of perception of projection. We think something's really popular, but when you pull up the numbers, you're like, hmm, it doesn't sell as many as I thought it did. So it's always like a wake up call. So again, keep your menu kind of streamlined at first. You know, baby steps is the way I kind of describe it. You want to take baby steps and don't roll everything out too fast. 
too soon because number one, it's going to overwhelm your team and it's going to overwhelm your guests. We got a question for me. Uh, from Jamie, small brewery here in Ohio, Hi Ho Brewing. Hi, Jamie. Can you speak a little on how your beer sales are going and tips on keeping the interest in addition to food? We have some food options, but we're trying to focus on how to up our beer sales as well. Great question. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, we, uh, we had just done a canning run before everything shut down. We had like five pallets ready to go out and all those orders got canceled. <laughs> so we had a lot of beer to move. And so we initially, uh, we, we lowered the prices to make it uh, uh, more approachable to the customer. Um, we didn't really want to sell singles because we knew if we were going to be able to keep our alcohol sales up, we would have to sell them by the four pack since, since we wouldn't be getting the same margins that you would get uh, on tap. Um, so we did start offering like a single serving can uh, paired with a special. Uh, so people did have a option of a single beer can if that's what they wanted, um, but we're certainly not doing everything in single cans. Um, and so we're just trying to find a way to move as much as, as possible. Uh, we didn't want to do growler fills because we did not want to deal with getting nasty, gross growlers in. Um, but at the same time, we've got like 50 kegs in storage that are just going to die. So I actually just ordered a bunch of two liter soda bottles. They're like 30 cents a piece for a pallet of a thousand. So it's 300 bucks. And uh, we're going to sell two liters of beer. Um, and that will be the discounted. So we'll still make our margins on the packaged beer for people who want the newer stuff, the fresher stuff. We're actually canning uh, right now today, uh, five new beers because all that beer has just been sitting in the tanks for the last month while we tried to figure out what we're gonna do with it. Um, and we're just putting it all into cans now. And so usually we wanna sell all our beer within a month, especially an IPA. And we've just accepted the fact that the shelf life is going to have to be expanded. Um, and, and that's okay, because everyone's going to be selling older beer right now. Um, so beyond that, I'm trying to get some custom boxes, uh, case boxes, and we are allowed to ship uh, directly to consumers with the right endorsement in Washington. Um, and so that's going to hopefully be like a third revenue stream to help us get back to where we were. Um, and then slowly as I can navigate other states liquor control rules, uh, we will try and add in whichever states we can starting with the markets that we're already in in Oregon and California. Um, and we'll just see how that goes. And so kind of touching on a little bit what Donald said about changing the, the menu size. We're looking at this um, as a huge opportunity to change the things that we didn't think we can change to hit a reset button on things. We had some troubles with some some uh, distributors uh, not, not really focusing on our product. Well, I don't think we could have pulled off mailing directs to consumer two months ago. Now that door has opened for us and we could get some regular business out of it and it could be something that we can continue for the rest of time. Um, when we first opened, we had order here signs. Uh, we had order at the counter. We were going for fast casual so we could spend less on labor, more into food quality and our demographic was about 20 years on average older than what our business plan was shooting for when we opened. And people were yelping from the order here line about how horrible it was. And I think it lasted about four months and we had to take those signs down. Uh, we actually put them right back up uh, the, day, uh, the day before the shutdown and had the lowest labor we've ever had. And no one was complaining about it because I think this, there's been a couple other fast casual places that have opened up. Uh, we've gotten our demographic back towards what we were shooting for in our business plan um, through grooming our customers. Um, so this is a huge opportunity for people to hit those reset buttons that they couldn't have gotten away from. Because if it wasn't for this and we tried to go back to order at the counter, I think there would have been a lot of people with their pitchforks again, like, oh, I remember how crappy that was last time. Um, so, yeah. Great. Well, we have a couple more questions about the Olo platform that I just want to address. Um, someone asked uh, if you can, oh, Paul asked if you can set a pickup schedule, i.e. orders in by six and then have available slots for pickup time. So with Upserve, you can set a pickup time um, and we're working to further improve that feature to give restaurants more flexibility in how many orders come in and when um, and how many orders they can take. So great question. Um, another person asked if the tickets go directly to the kitchen. Um, if you have your POS system set up with us, yes, it fully integrates with all your printers. So those orders, once they're accepted, go straight to the kitchen. Um, question from Alberta. Uh, should a restaurant use online ordering from multiple sources, Upserve, Uber Eats, Open Table, et cetera? Katie, Nate, do you want to weigh in on that? 
I was looking at that question. Yeah. Um, I don't see it as being necessary. Like I understand kind of wanting to saturate, um, you know, people have all kinds of apps on their phones for, for dining out and for ordering. And um, so I can kind of understand wanting to have a presence on all of them. But when I looked into it, it just, it seems like um, a quick Google gets the online ordering that is on your website in front of your customer. So it seems super necessary to me to, to be on every single platform. And I think it also, um, you have to think about how much time you want to put into this. If you're on every single platform, you're going to be spending so much time simply updating stupid stuff on your menu. Um, and that's a high energy <laughs> cost and it's a high labor cost if you're paying someone else to do it. Um, so I would just streamline it and, and do it um, through one, through one thing. And I think, um, you know, it might be different if you want to offer like a third party delivery. That's not something I do. So I can't really speak to that. Um, Cause we don't see a lot of demand for that in my neighborhood. Um, but yeah, I, I, I did a little bit of Googling around um, just to see like how uh, easy it was to find my online ordering once we got on board. And it seems like, you know, as long as you've set it up so that it's the first thing someone sees if they land on your URL should be, that should be sufficient. I would think. Yeah, and then the thing to keep in mind with the third party systems is they are going to charge you those commission fees. So yeah. while you are getting access to all of their customers and their audience, um, it does come at a price. So it's something to keep in mind. Um, we always encourage a proprietary online ordering system. So you're owning your online ordering and 100% of that revenue is coming to you. Um, question from Majid, does Upserve promote the new restaurants who do online ordering to get new clients? Yes. So right now we're running an offer. You sign up for online ordering. We will create and run a $100 Facebook ad for you in your community to get more guests ordering online from you. Thank you for asking. Um, we have a question from Low Key Bar and Grill. What tips would you give to a restaurant or a ghost kitchen looking to open right now? Right now, do it. <laughs> this is like the perfect opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. I have a, I had a guy who, I have a client who, uh, he's like, you know, there's some extra space in the back of the building. I'm thinking about renting it and doing a bakery. And I'm like, you should do it right now. It's like perfect time. You're gonna get a great deal from the landlord because they're looking to, they want to rent spaces because they're worried. And right now also too, there's going to be some sweet deals on used restaurant equipment. So perfect opportunity but you're gonna to have to market really aggressively you know that's the thing about a ghost kitchen is you have to make up because you don't have a physical location that people can actually come to it's all ghost stuff and it's usually using delivery service now if you partner up with third-party delivery service they're going to eat into your commissions one of the things i'm i'm kind of proposing to people is work with your governments your local governments to try to have someone put a cap. Now, I know, I know like uh, in San Francisco, they put a cap on third-party delivery at 10%, you know, because normally third-party delivery, I mean, you can get up there like 25, 30%. San Francisco took initiative and say, that's not gonna work for our restaurants. So they actually put a cap in place. So work with some of your legislation, work with your local governments, work with your state governments, try to get them, put some pressure on them, get petitions out there, about pushing on the you know thing on third party delivery about putting caps on those things but ghost kitchens are i mean they are the future in the sense that you know you're going to see them i don't know how long they're going to last you know and you also could do you know instead of a ghost kitchen how about this idea how about a host kitchen where maybe you partner up with a couple of small restaurants in your local or neighborhood and you do a pop-up kitchen inside your takeout menu so like Katie has a place, maybe there's a, you know, a little, another little place down the street. Maybe she says on Monday night or Tuesday night, we're doing a pop-up, you know, host event, partnering up with them. And then you guys help each other and you market each other. So that's an opportunity right there. That's a great idea. Well, uh, I'm going to close the questions. We've had so many and I want to be respectful of our panelists time, but I'm so grateful for all of you for joining us. We went way over time. Um, but clearly there's a lot of interest in this topic. If we did not get to your question, I will try to get back to you personally um, because I want to make sure everyone has their questions answered. For those of you who had a feature request and your existing UpServe customers, um, I will reach out to you as well to make sure you get your questions answered. Um, I want to say thank you to all of our panelists, Katie, Donald, Nate. This was really informative. This was fantastic. I'm really grateful for your time and thrilled to see you thriving in this really uncertain time. And uh, I think you shared a lot of great advice today. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thanks to all of our attendees. This was really, really fantastic conversation. We're going to be doing more of these. Um, so, you know, stay tuned to our social media um, and your email. We'll be sending out invites. And again, you know, for those of you who are looking to get started with online ordering, Upserve can get you up and running for 100% free really, really quickly. Upserve.com, we will get you started. Um, if you have more questions about how it would work with your system, uh, we have tons of experts ready to talk to you on the phone or on chat who can get you started. Um, so thank you so much for joining us and hope we can help you guys all get started with online ordering. And I hope you all have a great Tuesday. Thank you so much. Take care, everybody. Stay safe. Wash your thank hands. You. <laughs> thank you.